Hello, I'm Alan Roberts, welcoming you back for part three of Math Made Easy Geometry. Today, Vanessa Stewart and I will present a detailed look at triangles. We will begin with right triangles. Then we will talk about triangles that are congruent to each other. Finally, we will learn about triangles that are similar to each other. We'll start with right triangles. We're going to talk about a special relationship that exists between the sides of any right triangle. The name of this relationship is the Pythagorean Theorem. It's named after the Greek mathematician Pythagoras, who lived about 2,500 years ago. Actually, this relationship was known and used many centuries before Pythagoras, but Pythagoras proved that the theorem is true. First, we have some definitions. In a right triangle, the side that is opposite the right angle is called the hypotenuse. The other two sides are called the legs. The Pythagorean theorem says that the square of the length of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths of the two legs. In this figure, we have labeled the hypotenuse C and the two legs A and B. The theorem can be stated as A squared plus B squared equals C squared. To help justify this theorem, consider this example. We've placed a right triangle on the coordinate plane, and we have the lengths of each of the two legs equal to two. Let's place squares upon each of the three sides of this triangle. The areas of the squares that are on the legs of the triangle are each equal to two times two for a total of four. You can verify that by counting the boxes in the squares. The area of the square that is on the hypotenuse is 8. You can verify that by counting the boxes in the square. You'll see that there are four whole squares and then another eight half squares, which add up to four more. So the entire area of this square that was built on the hypotenuse is 8. In our triangle, a squared and b squared are each 4, and c squared is a sum of those two numbers for a total of 8. If you know the lengths of two sides of a right triangle, you can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the length of the third side. For example, suppose that you are given that the lengths of the two legs of a right triangle are equal to 3 and 4. How long is the hypotenuse? Using the Pythagorean theorem, we have that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So 3 squared plus 4 squared equals c squared. That gives us that 9 plus 16 equals c squared, or c squared equals 25. Can you now tell what c is equal to? c is that number whose square is 25. We call that number the square root of 25, and we use the square root symbol. The answer is 5 because 5 squared equals 25. If you have a calculator with a square root symbol, you could key in 25 and then press the square root symbol to get the answer of 5. Here's another example. Given a right triangle whose hypotenuse is 13 and one of whose legs is 5, how long is the other leg? a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Substituting, we have that 5 squared plus b squared equals 13 squared. 25 plus b squared equals 169. So b squared equals 169 minus 25, which equals 144. Then b equals the square root of 144. With a calculator, we key in 144 and then the square root symbol to get the answer of 12. The Pythagorean theorem enables us to find the length of any line segment on the coordinate plane. For example, suppose you are asked to find the length of the line segment between the points A and B, whose coordinates are 1, 3 and 7, 11. AB is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Let us draw the point C at the bottom right corner. AC and CB are the legs of our right triangle. C has coordinates 7, 3. Remember that the length of AC is obtained by subtracting the x-coordinates, giving us 7 minus 1, which equals 6. The length of CB is obtained by subtracting the y-coordinates, giving us 11 minus 3, which equals 8. Using our formula, a squared plus B squared equals C squared. We have 
6 squared plus 8 squared equals c squared. 36 plus 64 equals c squared. So c squared equals 100. Then the length of AB is the square root of 100, which equals 10. Let's do another problem where the arithmetic is a little bit harder. What is the distance between the points A and B whose coordinates are negative 1, 5 and 2, negative 3? Again, draw the point C at 2, 5 to form a right triangle. To find the length of AC, subtract the x-coordinates of A and C from each other. That gives us 2 minus negative 1, so the length of AC is 3. Similarly, the length of BC is the difference of the y-coordinates. That gives us 5 minus negative 3, so the length of BC is 8. C squared equals A squared plus B squared, which equals 3 squared plus 8 squared, or 9 plus 64, which equals 73. Then C equals the square root of 73. The square root of 73 is not a whole number. You can find its approximate value by using a calculator. Keying in 73, and then the square root sign gives us 8.5440037. This is not an exact answer, but it's a good approximation, and it tells us that the length is about 8.5. In general, this method allows us to find the distance between any two points A and B in the coordinate plane. Let the first point A have coordinates x1, y1, and let the second point B have coordinates x2, y2. To make a right triangle, draw a new point C with coordinates x2, y1. The horizontal distance between A and C is obtained by subtracting the x-coordinates, giving us x2 minus x1. The vertical distance between C and B is obtained by subtracting the y-coordinates, giving us y2 minus y1. Since c squared equals a squared plus b squared, c equals the square root of a squared plus b squared. That equals the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. This is a general formula that can be used to find the distance between any two points. Here's another theorem that relates to the Pythagorean theorem. If the three sides of a triangle are A, B, and C, and if A squared plus B squared equals C squared, then the triangle must be a right triangle. Notice that this theorem is not the same as the Pythagorean theorem. It is actually the converse. The Pythagorean theorem states that if the triangle is a right triangle, then the relation holds. And now we're saying that if the equation holds true, then the triangle is a right triangle. Here's an example of how to apply this theorem. Suppose that you are given three points, and let's call these points P, Q, and R. The coordinates of P are 3, 2. The coordinates of Q are negative 2, negative 3. And the coordinates of R are negative 4, negative 1. Is the triangle that's formed by these three points a right triangle? To find out, We'll determine the lengths of the sides of the triangle. What is the square of the distance between P and Q? Using the formula for the distance between two points, the answer is 50. What is the square of the distance between Q and R? The answer is 8. What about the square of the distance between P and R? That answer is 58. So, is the triangle a right triangle? Since 50 plus 8 equals 58, we can conclude that PQR is a right triangle. The right angle is at the vertex Q. There are a few special right triangles that you should know about. First, consider an isosceles right triangle. Suppose that the two legs of a right triangle are congruent. What conclusions can we make? First, we know that the base angles of any isosceles triangle are congruent. The right angle has 90 degrees, and we know that the sum of the measures of all of the angles of the triangle equals 180 degrees. That leaves another 90 degrees for the two congruent base angles. Therefore, 
each of these base angles must equal half of 90 degrees or 45 degrees. The two legs are of equal length. Let us refer to that length by the letter A and let C be the length of the hypotenuse. Now by the Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus A squared equals C squared. Now a little bit of algebra. C squared equals A squared plus A squared, which equals 2A squared. C equals the square root of 2A squared, which equals the square root of 2 times A. In summary, an isosceles right triangle has angles of measure 45, 45, and 90, and the sides are in the proportion 1 to 1 to the square root of 2. Let us use this result to answer a question about baseball. A baseball diamond is in the shape of a square. Each side of the square is 90 feet long. What is the distance from home plate to second base? Let us draw the diagonal of the square from home plate to second base. This cuts the square into two isosceles right triangles with legs equal to 90 feet. As we've just shown, the hypotenuse is the square root of 2 times 90. Using a calculator, we key in 2 and then the square root sign to get the square root of 2. We need to multiply by 90. So now we key in the multiplication sign, then 90, and then the equal sign. We see that the distance is approximately 127 feet. Another important right triangle is the 30-60-90 triangle. That means a triangle with two angles whose measures are 30 and 60 degrees respectively plus a right angle. It can be shown that the hypotenuse is twice as long as the shortest leg. If the hypotenuse is of length 2 and the shorter leg is of length 1, let us use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of the other leg. Calling the longer leg B, we have 1 squared plus B squared equals 2 squared. 1 squared plus B squared equals 4. B squared equals 4 minus 1 which equals 3. So b equals the square root of 3. Before we begin our next topic, we want to present an interesting question about playing billiards. You may know that when a ball bounces off the side of a billiard table, we can tell in which direction it will bounce. The angle that the ball makes with the wall that it hits is the very same as the angle that the ball makes on the rebound. OK, here's a question. Suppose I shoot a ball from one wall to the midpoint of the next wall. Where will the ball bounce back to? Let us draw a figure to illustrate. We shoot a ball from the C to the midpoint M of the side AB. We know that it bounces back in a fashion so that the angles that are shown are congruent. Can we conclude that the point D that it bounces back to will be as far from AB as our starting point C? We want to show that the distance CA is the same as the distance DB. If we could show that the triangles CAM and DBM are the very same size and shape and that they only differ in position, that would help us prove that CA equals BD. We'll address this topic now as we begin our discussion of congruent triangles. We've used the word congruent often in our study of geometry. We say that angles are congruent if they have the same measure, and line segments are congruent if they have the same length. Now we say that two triangles are congruent if they have exactly the same size and shape. The three sides of the first triangle must be exactly the same lengths as the sides of the second triangle, and the three angles of the first triangle must be exactly the same measure as the angles of the second triangle. In other words, if you would cut out one triangle and move it over the second, they must fit exactly. It is not enough for one or even two of the sides to have equal length. As you can see, AB is congruent to DE in these triangles, and AC is congruent to DF, but the triangles are certainly not congruent. The above definition of congruence requires that six different things be congruent, three sets of sides and three sets of angles, but there are three postulates that make it easier to verify congruence. These postulates are commonly referred to by their initials SSS, SAS, and ASA. First, SSS. That stands for side, side, side. If the three sides of one triangle are congruent to the corresponding sides of the second triangle, 
then the triangles are congruent. If we know that the sides are congruent, then we do not need to show that the angles are congruent. This will be true automatically. The second postulate is SAS, which stands for side angle side. If two sides and the included angle of one triangle are congruent to two sides and the included angle of another triangle, then the triangles are congruent. Notice that it has to be in that sequence. Side, then the included angle, and then side. If the congruent angle is not exactly between the two sides, then the triangles might not be congruent. That is a common mistake. In this figure, you can see this SSA, or side-side angle situation. The triangles have two sides and the angle opposite one of the sides congruent, but the triangles are not congruent. The third postulate about congruent triangles is called ASA, which stands for angle-side-angle. If two angles and the included side of one triangle match two angles and the included side of the other, then the triangles are congruent. These three postulates can be used in many cases to prove the congruence of triangles. Let's look at some examples. Given that two sets of angles and a non-included side are congruent, prove that the two triangles are congruent. We can call this AAS. It might remind you of ASA, but it is a little bit different. In ASA, the side is between the angles. In our new AAS case, the side is not between the angles. Let us prove that AAS makes the triangles congruent. Remember that the sum of the measures of the three angles of any triangle is 180 degrees. Therefore, the third angle of each triangle measures 180 degrees minus the sum of the measures of the first two angles. Since two angles in one triangle are congruent to two angles in the other triangle, the third angles must also be congruent. Since all of the angles in one triangle are congruent to angles of the other triangle, we can focus on the two angles in each triangle that include the congruent sides. Then we can use the ASA postulate to conclude that the triangles are congruent. In conclusion, in addition to the SSS, SAS, and ASA postulates, we have the AAS theorem. If two angles and a non-included side in one triangle are congruent to two angles and a non-included side of the other, then the triangles are congruent. In our next example, we are given that triangle ABC is an isosceles triangle. Remember that isosceles means two of the sides are congruent. In other words, they have equal lengths. Assume that AB and BC are those sides. We can write side AB is congruent to side BC, or we can simply write AB equals BC. Notice that the letters AB or BC, written with a bar over them, give the name of the line segment, and we say that segment AB is congruent to segment BC. The same letters without a bar indicate the length of the segment, so it is correct to write AB is equal to BC. Now let M be the midpoint of the third side AC. Prove that the two triangles that were formed, triangle ABM and triangle CBM, are congruent. Can you think of how to prove it? We do not know anything about the angles of the two triangles, but we do know about the sides. That makes us think about using SSS. Well, AB equals BC because that is a given. We also know that M is the midpoint of AC because that is also given. That makes AM equal CM because a midpoint divides a side into equal segments. Finally, BM equals BM by identity. We found that the three sides of triangle ABM are congruent to three sides of triangle CBM. Then by the SSS postulate, the triangles are congruent. This leads to another valuable result. Since the two triangles are congruent, we know that corresponding angles are congruent. In particular, angles BAM and BCM are corresponding angles. They are both opposite the side BM, and they are both included between congruent pairs of sides. So angle BAM must be congruent to angle BCM. These angles are the base angles of the original triangle ABC. We have proven the important and valuable theorem that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent. 
The converse of this theorem is also true. That is to say, if two angles of a triangle are congruent, then the triangle is isosceles. This can be proven as follows. Given triangle ABC, and given that angle A is congruent to angle C, draw a line segment from B down to the base of the triangle, bisecting angle B. Now angle B has been divided into two equal parts, which we call angles 1 and 2. Triangle BAP is congruent to triangle BCP by the AAS theorem. Both triangles contain side BP, giving us the congruent side. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 2 because we constructed it that way. And angle A is congruent to angle C, which was given. Since the two triangles are congruent, AB and CB must also be congruent to each other. Now, here's a problem with another little twist. In this figure, we are given that AB is congruent to DC, and that AB and DC are both perpendicular to BC. Can you prove that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DCB? The added twist about this problem is that the two triangles overlap. If you have colored pencils, it is helpful in this kind of problem to show the two triangles in different colors, or alternately draw the triangles separately. Make believe that you slide the two triangles apart. In the two triangles, we can use SAS as follows. AB was given to be congruent to DC. The right angles at B and C are congruent, and the side BC is in each of the triangles. That gives us SAS. If two triangles are known to be right triangles, we can sometimes use the Pythagorean theorem to help prove congruence. For example, suppose we are given that the hypotenuse of one right triangle is the same length as the hypotenuse of a second right triangle, and we are also told that one leg of the first triangle is the same length as one leg of the second triangle. Can we conclude that the two triangles are congruent? If the triangles were not right triangles, then we could not conclude that they were congruent. This is the side-side angle situation that we described before. But because we are told that they are right triangles, we can prove them congruent. The method is as follows. Since the triangles are right triangles, the Pythagorean theorem can be used to figure out the length of the third side. This third side is of equal length in the two triangles. So now we have congruence by the SSS postulate. This theorem that we just proved is often referred to as high leg. High stands for hypotenuse and leg refers to one of the legs because it was given that the hypotenuse and one leg of the first triangle are congruent to the corresponding parts of the second triangle. Now that we have discussed various postulates and theorems about the congruence of triangles, let us get back to our question about the billiard ball. Can you prove that triangle CAM is congruent to triangle DBM? Press the pause button while you try the problem. We were told that M is the midpoint of AB. Therefore, AM is congruent to MB. The right angles at A and B are also congruent, and we stated earlier that angles CMA and DMB are congruent, so the triangles are congruent by ASA. Therefore, their corresponding sides are congruent. In particular, the sides AC and DB are opposite the congruent angles and therefore congruent to each other. So the billiard ball bounces off the side and hits the back wall at D which is exactly as far from the side wall as the point C where it started. Now that we have spent some time discussing triangles that are congruent, let us begin talking about triangles that are not necessarily congruent, but are similar. All right, but I think you'd better tell us what you mean by similar. Let me explain. Look at these two triangles. Their sizes are different. As a matter of fact, the triangle on the right is exactly twice as big as the triangle on the left, but the shapes of the two triangles are the same, in that their angles are exactly congruent. We call these two triangles similar, and we use this wavy line symbol to represent similarity. In this example, one triangle is twice the size of the second, but it could be any proportion. 
In general, we say that the two triangles are similar when the angles of the first are congruent to the angles of the second, and when the lengths of the corresponding sides are in proportion. Could you please explain more precisely what you meant by saying that the corresponding sides are in proportion? Surely. In our first example, the sides of the second triangle were twice the size of the first. We say that the ratio of the sides of the big triangle to the corresponding sides of the little triangle is 2. The ratio is the same for all three sides. D is twice as long as A, E is twice as long as B, and F is twice as long as C. The ratio does not need to be 2. It can be any number. When we say that the corresponding sides are in proportion, the length of each side of the second triangle is that ratio times the length of the corresponding side of the first triangle. If we call the ratio k, then d is k times as long as a, e is k times as long as b, and f is k times as long as c. When we learned about congruent triangles, we had a number of postulates and theorems to use as shortcuts. It was not necessary to prove that each angle and each side of the two triangles were congruent. The same thing is true about similarity. It is not necessary to prove each angle congruent and each side proportional to a corresponding part. The following are some of these shortcut methods for proving triangles similar. If the angles of two triangles are congruent, then the triangles are similar, and the sides have to be proportional. And since the measures of the three angles of any triangle add up to 180 degrees, once we know that two of the angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of a second triangle, it follows the third set is also congruent. So we can prove triangles similar if two angles of one are congruent to two angles of the other. This is called angle-angle, or for short, AA. If all of the three sides of the two triangles are in proportion, we can also conclude that the triangles are similar. We call that SSS. But note that it is different from the SSS postulate that we had for congruent triangles. To prove congruence by SSS, three sides of one triangle must be congruent to three sides of the other triangle. The sides only need to be proportional to prove the triangle similar. A third method for proving triangles similar is called side-angle-side, or SAS. This theorem says that if two sides of one triangle are proportional to two sides of another, and if the angles between them are congruent, then the triangles are similar. Again, that is different from the SAS that we talked about for congruent triangles. If the two sides of the SAS are congruent, then the triangles are congruent. If the two sides of the SAS are proportional, then the triangles are similar. Here's an exercise that uses the information that we have learned about similar triangles. Given triangle ABC, and given that the line DE is parallel to AB, prove that AC and BC are proportional to DC and EC. The method for proving proportionality is by using similar triangles. Can you prove that triangle ABC is similar to triangle DEC? Press the pause button while you work. Well, angles 2 and 4 are congruent since they are corresponding angles of parallel lines. Angles 3 and 5 are also congruent for the same reason. Then triangles ABC and DEC are similar by AA. Therefore, the sides are proportional. Our next example uses coordinate geometry. Consider the triangle ABC whose vertices are at the points 1, 1, 3, 1, and 4, 2. Let us see what happens when we multiply every one of those coordinates by a single number. For example, let us choose 10 as the ratio. Multiplying each coordinate by 10, we get three new points with coordinates 10, 10, 30, 10, and 40, 20. Plotting these three points, we get another triangle, DEF. What is the relationship between the triangles ABC and DEF? Can you show them to be similar? Let's use the distance formula to find the lengths of the sides of the triangles. The distance AB is easiest. Subtract the x-coordinates to get 3 minus 1 equals 2.
To get the distance BC, we use the formula that we talked about in the last tape. The distance BC equals the square root of 4 minus 3 squared plus 2 minus 1 squared. That equals the square root of 2. The distance AC equals the square root of 4 minus 1 squared plus 2 minus 1 squared. That equals the square root of 10. Now let us find the lengths of the sides of triangle DEF. The horizontal distance from D to E is 20. The formula gives us that the distance from E to F is the square root of 40 minus 30 squared plus 20 minus 10 squared. That equals the square root of 200. The distance from D to F is the square root of 40 minus 10 squared plus 20 minus 10 squared. The result is the square root of 1,000. Are the sides in proportion? DE is 10 times as long as AB. The length of EF is the square root of 200, which equals 10 times the square root of 2. So EF is 10 times as long as BC. The length of DF is the square root of 1,000, which equals 10 times the square root of 10. So DF is 10 times as long as AC. The triangles are therefore similar by SSS. Finally, there are a few more ratios that hold true for similar triangles. If two triangles are similar, we said previously that the sides are in proportion. There is a number k called the ratio, such that the length of each side of the first triangle is equal to k times the length of the corresponding side of the second triangle. There are a number of other lengths that are also in the same proportion. We'll talk about the perimeters, the angle bisectors, the medians, and the altitudes. First, the perimeters. The perimeter of a triangle is the sum of the lengths of the three sides. If we add the lengths of the sides of the second triangle, we get D plus E plus F. That equals K times A plus K times B plus K times C, which equals K times A plus B plus C. It follows that the perimeter of the second triangle is equal to k times the perimeter of the first triangle. Next, the angle bisectors. An angle bisector is a line that cuts an angle in half. Suppose we have similar triangles and we draw lines that bisect corresponding angles. In our figure, the congruent angles C and F have been cut in half and we have extended the bisectors to the opposite sides of the triangles to points X and Y. We are about to prove that CX and FY are in the same proportion as the sides of the triangles. The resulting angles 1 and 2 are each one half of congruent angles, so they must be congruent. Angles A and D are congruent because they are corresponding angles of the original similar triangles. So triangle AXC must be similar to triangle DYF by AA. It follows that the lines CX and FY must be in the same proportion. What about the medians? We explained in the last videotape that the medians from C and F are the segments that cut the opposite sides in half. AX is half of AB and DY is half of DE. We are going to prove that the medians CX and FY are also in the same ratio. We will prove it by showing that the triangle AXC is similar to triangle DYF. We know that the big triangles ABC and DEF are similar and that side AB is equal to K times DE. Multiplying both sides of the equation by one half gives us that one half of AB is K times one half of DE. That is to say, AX is K times DY. In addition to AX being proportional to DY, the similarity of the original triangles shows that AC is proportional to DF, and the angles between them at A and D are congruent. We now have the triangles AXC and DYF similar by using SAS. Therefore, the medians CX and FY are in the same ratio as the other sides of the triangle. Finally, we'll show that the altitudes are also in the same ratio. Remember that altitudes are the segments that are drawn from C and F perpendicular to the opposite sides. Triangles AXC and DYF are similar by the AA rule. 
This is because angles 1 and 2 are both right angles and are therefore congruent. And angles A and D are congruent because they are the corresponding angles of the original big triangles. Since triangles AXC and DYF are similar, we conclude that the altitudes CX and FY are in the same proportion. That concludes tape three of Math Made Easy Geometry. You've learned a lot about triangles in this tape, beginning with the Pythagorean theorem for right triangles and continuing on to congruent and similar triangles. Review all the material carefully. Make sure you understand and remember the definitions, postulates, and theorems we introduced. When you feel confident that you've mastered triangles, join us for part four of Math Made Easy Geometry, when we'll take a closer look at quadrilaterals. Until then, I'm Alan Roberts. And I'm Vanessa Stewart. Good luck with your studies. We'll see you again soon.